Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We're studying the book of Exodus. We're making our way through this book and we are ready for Exodus chapter 17 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a copy of the Bible and joining us in Exodus chapter 17. We'll be there in just a moment. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns with tonight's class, if there's some way we can help you, if there's something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we invite you to get in touch. Send me a message at info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. We are back to the book of Exodus, and tonight we are in Exodus chapter 17. So up to this point in the book, God has delivered his people from slavery in Egypt, they have now crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. Last week we had them whine and complain at the lack of food in the wilderness. And you may remember they even said that they missed the pots of meat that they had back there in Egypt. And in response, God provides manna. And that word manna means, what is it? It was actually a question. It was a fine bread-like substance. The Lord also provides quail, birds that would apparently just uh, drop themselves into the camp every day. And in this process, God uses the manna to teach these people about the Sabbath day. So they are to collect no more than what they need every day. And then they are not to try to save any for the next day, but they are to collect twice as much on day number six so that they don't have to do any work on day number seven, which is the seventh, uh, the Sabbath, a day of rest. And we learn that God gave the Sabbath only for the Jewish people and only for those who were living under the law of Moses. He never enforced it on the Gentiles, never enforced it, never gave it as a law at any point before Moses here in this chapter we just studied last week. So tonight we pick up with Exodus chapter 17. This chapter is not a long one at all. It's a fairly short chapter. So tonight's study will most likely be a bit shorter than most of our studies in this book. So let's jump back into it tonight, picking up with Exodus chapter 17. And the first paragraph is verses 1, 2, and 3. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Well, up in verse 1, we find that they journeyed by stages through the wilderness. I just find that to be an interesting reference. I would take this to mean that they traveled for a few days and camped out and then traveled a little bit more and then camped out and so on. So they weren't making some huge journey all at once. We might say they were traveling in spurts. And somewhere along the way, pretty early in their journeys, they ran out of water again. If you remember, we had something similar happen a few chapters ago where they had water. But it was bitter, if you remember that. They couldn't drink it. It wasn't drinkable water. And so God told Moses to toss a particular tree into the water, and that turned the water into water that they could drink. And if you remember our study from back then, we were thinking that the lack of water was perhaps something of a test. I mean, certainly God knew that they needed water. God is not uh, causing them to die of thirst on purpose, but he does allow them to get thirsty perhaps to try to teach them to go to him for help. So this is a learning experience as God kind of reintroduces himself to the nation. Well, now it happens again. We're not told exactly how long has gone by, but it seems to be a fairly short time. But this time, yet again, they grumble. And even here it says that they quarrel or they argue with Moses over this. And so they make this demand, give us water that we may drink. And once again, Moses redirects them to the Lord. You know, why are you arguing with me? I mean, how can I provide water for two to three million people? This is beyond me as well. Why are you really testing the Lord over this? So this argument with God and with Moses, it doesn't fix the water situation. They're still thirsty. And so once again, they accuse Moses of bringing them out there in the wilderness to kill them and their children and their livestock with thirst. Well, as we studied this a, a week or two ago, this makes no sense, does it? Uh, Moses didn't want this job in the first place. His mission is not to kill two to three million people with thirst in the wilderness. And besides, if his goal was to kill two to three million people, he would have saved himself a bunch of effort by just drowning them in the Red Sea instead of leading them all the way out there in the wilderness to kill them with thirst. There are uh, quicker ways to deal with this. 
Uh, but this is the situation. The people are thirsty, and they come to Moses, and they're actually arguing with Moses and with God about it. All right, let's continue then with the next paragraph, Exodus 17, verses 4 through 7. Exodus 17, verses 4 through 7. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, in response to the whining, notice here Moses is caught in the middle, just as he was last time. So once again, Moses takes this concern to God. And it's bad, isn't it? I mean, it's so bad, in fact, that Moses is worried that the people may actually stone him to death. And he's God's appointed leader. And so I think we would say that Moses at this point is feeling the burden of leadership, isn't he? And God has given him this mission to accomplish, but the people he's supposed to be leading, they do not want to be led. And so here we have Moses suffering this leadership crisis. Well, God, though, has a solution. Moses is to make himself visible. And that's kind of the way I would summarize the middle part of this here. Don't do this in secret, but let yourself be seen. Go out there in front of the people take with you some of the elders of Israel. And I think that's interesting. Moses is not to do this on his own, but notice he is to apparently take some respected older men from among the people. He is to bring these men with him as he does what he is about to do. So I don't know if they are simply witnesses, if this is giving him some legitimacy, or maybe this kind of seems to me perhaps to be some sharing of leadership in a sense. This isn't all on Moses. This is something that will be done uh, somewhat as a group. And notice God's instruction here is that Moses is to take his Moses stick. That's what they call it at Bible camp. The same staff that he used to uh, part the Red Sea and, and strike the water um, in the Nile and so on. And so he is to strike the rock at Horeb. And God will then cause water to come out of the rock for the people to drink. So those are the instructions. Get some elders with you. Go out there. Go in front of the people. Pass in front of them. Take your staff and then go and strike the rock and uh, God will take care of this. Well, as we talked about a week or two ago, God could have made water spring up anywhere, couldn't he? Couldn't he? he could have provided a, a flood to come in. He could have provided a well. He could have made it rain. Uh, any number of ways God could have solved this problem, but instead he chooses to make Moses the conduit, so to speak, of this blessing. And I believe, in my opinion, he's doing this to solidify Moses' leadership credentials before the people. God is making Moses worth following. At least that's what this seems to be, in my opinion. So it's giving him some leadership cred. Well, this is what happens. God provides water from the rock as a result of Moses striking it. And now we need to remember this because of what happens later. And if you're familiar with these first five books of the Bible, I think this is a, hmm, one of those moments where this sounds familiar. Toward the end of their 40 years in the wilderness, as I understand it, they run out of water again. And the people complain again. And way over in Numbers chapter 20, Moses says, Listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And then the Bible says that Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod and so on. And rock, uh, water came out of the rock just as before. Uh, but this time, that second time, God was upset with Moses. And in fact, that seems to be what keeps him from crossing over the Jordan with his people. And we look at that and it may not seem fair. But the verses leading up to that, over in Numbers chapter 20, God had told Moses to speak to the rock. And I don't know whether you noticed this, but Moses almost seems a little bit arrogant that second time when he says, listen now, you rebels, look at what I'm about to do for you, and so on, just paraphrasing there. So God, I think, was upset that Moses did not treat God as being holy. But this is the first reference to getting water from a rock that we studied here in Exodus and this first time, God tells Moses to strike the rock, to get the water out of it. The next time, God, uh, Moses ignored God's instruction 
uh, to speak to at that final time, rather, over in Numbers chapter 20. And Moses went back to what he was familiar with. I think he kind of trusted in his own abilities. You know, I'm going to strike it just like I did many years earlier, and that rock is going to do for me what it did back then, kind of leaving God out of that process in his arrogance. Well, in verse 7, they renamed the place to remind them of the testing that took place there. And we do that today also. Uh, big events happen, and we change the name of a place. And, and we think we have some uh, place names that go back forever. They do not go back forever, do we? We are relative newcomers here to North America, and we're kind of giving places our own names as we go along, just kind of as they did passing through the wilderness. So let's continue with Exodus chapter 17, verses uh, 8 through 13. The next section here, Exodus 17, verses 8 through 13. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. It's kind of a strange paragraph here, isn't it? I mean, we're dealing with a lack of water. God solves that miraculously through Moses. And then suddenly, out of the blue, the Israelites are attacked by these people, the Amalekites. And I believe this is the first real enemy that they face, other than the Egyptians themselves. I think this is the first battle that they actually fight. You may, you may remember they didn't really fight the Egyptians. God took care of that in the Red Sea. And so in response to this threat from the Amalekites, Moses has Joshua to go out and choose men to fight in this battle. And this is the first reference to Joshua anywhere in the Bible. And here this guy named Joshua pops on the scene. He seems to be some kind of military leader, doesn't he? And if he wasn't already, he definitely is a military leader now. And so Joshua then is to coordinate the actual fighting. And Moses will observe, uh, perhaps giving instruction from the top of a nearby hill. And we actually talked about this in sermon form in one of our studies from Hebrews on a Sunday morning not too long ago when we came to that passage about lifting up the hands that are weak and strengthening the knees that are feeble. If you remember that, I think the scripture reading that morning went back to Exodus chapter 17, this passage that we're in tonight. Well, as Moses is on top of this nearby hill, along with his brother Aaron and, and Hur, uh, somehow he realizes that when he's holding his hand up, the Israelites prevail, but when he lowers his hand, the Amalekites start to prevail. And as we talked about in the sermon a few weeks ago, it'd be interesting to see how he discovered that. I mean, that's kind of a strange thing to notice. You're holding your hands up and the battle line moves one way and you let your hands down and the battle line moves back the other way. You would think you would try that a few times before you realize what's actually going on there. Well, obviously holding your hands up gets uh, old very quickly, doesn't it? I think we uh, studied a while back and uh, summarized it. Somebody said the weight of what you're holding depends on how long you're holding it. I mean, if you're cup, uh, holding just like a cup of water out at arm's length, that gets heavy after a few minutes. You know, it doesn't have to be a 30-pound weight. Anyway, um, this is important. So Aaron and her step, step up. They, they come in. They get Moses a rock to sit on. They pull that in there, have him sit down. Then they support his hands. So Aaron on one side, her on the other. And then with their help, Moses is able to keep his hands up until sunset that night, allowing Joshua and the Israelites to overwhelm the Amalekites. What a strange account. Isn't this a weird one? That's just one of these bizarre things in Scripture. It's just an unusual thing. I mean, obviously, God has done this. God gave them the victory. But what a strange connection between Moses' hands being up and this victory over the Amalekites. As with the water from a rock, there are many ways that God could have handled this situation. But he chooses to tie this victory to Moses' hands being raised. And Moses, though, couldn't do it without help from Aaron and Hur. You know, in terms of practical lessons, I can't help but wonder whether God was trying to convince Moses to lean on others for support. If you're familiar with what comes next in the next few chapters, Moses is going to have some issues delegating. He, he's doing a lot of stuff himself. And so perhaps some of the message here that God is trying to communicate is, Moses, you cannot lead these people on your own. 
You cannot be the only leader for this many people, but you are surrounded by good people who are willing to step in and help if you'll just let them step in and help. And to me, that seems to be a pretty good message for us today, doesn't it? It is okay to get help from others, especially when we're doing the Lord's work. We are not expected to do everything ourselves. And then on the other side of this, if we look at it from the other point of view, be Aaron. Be her to somebody in your life today. You know, since they were born, I've told our children, um, you do not need to work full time for the Lord to use your talents for God. But when you grow up, you know, this is the message from, from early on, use your talents, use your skills in whatever way that you can to honor God. Do what you do with all your might and do it for the Lord. And I've encouraged them that if I'm ever not their preacher, if they ever leave this city, if I'm ever not their preacher, support the preaching of the gospel in any way possible. Preachers need backup. They need people behind the scenes holding their hands up. And that seems to be a practical lesson from the account of Moses raising his hands in the victory over the Amalekites. Like Moses, first of all, you cannot do it by yourself. But then on the other hand, be like Aaron and her. And do whatever you can to support and encourage the leadership at your local congregation. Be like Aaron and her. And do not be like those who are always complaining about the food and the water. That seems to be a practical lesson from this passage tonight. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last few verses. Exodus 17, verses 14 through 16. Exodus 17, verses 14 through 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. You know, I know Genesis is the book of first, but we've had several firsts in Exodus tonight, haven't we? The first reference to Joshua, uh, now the first reference to writing. Uh, God commands Moses to write this account in a book. And I almost think of this like, um, in my mind, the captain's log from, from Star Trek, Stardate, whatever. This is what happened. You know, this is to be a record of what happened in the wilderness. And then Moses is to pass this along to Joshua when it's time to pass the baton of leadership to that next generation. And I, in my opinion, I believe Exodus is most likely the book that he's referring to here. So write it in a book. We are now reading that book that he wrote. And the note that is to be passed down is that they've won the battle against the Amalekites, but the war is not over. You know, we took care of the immediate threat. They came, they sent their army out to get us, but there are still other Amalekites out there. These people attacked you, attacked God's people with no provocation whatsoever. And this war against the Amalekites will continue on uh, from generation to generation. These people will be a thorn in your side until you ultimately take care of it. And just a side note, it is this war against the Amalekites that will bring down King Saul several hundred years later. You may remember many years later, God would tell Saul to kill every single Amalekite. You know, I'm, I'm going to now, now that you're settled in the land, now that you've got your first king, we're going to go take care of business. And so Saul, you need to go to the Amalekites and you need to kill them all, kill absolutely everything, wipe them off the face of the earth for what they did. They're still evil people. But remember what Saul did? Saul spares some of their flocks and some of their people, including their king, in this attempt to honor God in some way. So he comes back from the war and, and the prophet says, you know, what have you done? I'm just paraphrasing that chapter. Go and check that out. Find that in, uh, in the accounts later on in the Old Testament. But he, he says that he's doing this to honor God, but that's not what God commanded. And so if you're not doing what God has commanded, you're not honoring God. We can't make up stuff on our own to honor God when God has told us to do something else. And so Saul will ultimately lose his kingship over this. And I'm just saying that these are the same people. These are the Amalekites who lived in that area. Nevertheless, as a result of this immediate victory in this battle, Moses builds this altar and he names it, The Lord is My Banner. Ancient armies, of course, would often carry banners. There'd be a pole with a banner. Don't we do the same thing today? Flags, as we would say today, a piece of cloth on the end of a long stick, patches on uniforms. And those banners back in the ancient world would identify their king. This is who we're fighting for. 
And God is their king at this point. God is their banner. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 17. Like I said, this is a short chapter. So I think we're probably done before we normally be done. But we've had some practical lessons tonight. Don't whine. And then also lean on other people for help when you're doing the Lord's work. But also support those who are doing the work. Support your leaders in the local congregation. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, let us know. If there's something we can do to encourage you, give a call, send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can send a text or give me a call personally at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the king of our hearts. And we honor you tonight for providing for us. We know from scripture, we know from personal experience that you give us food and water every day. And tonight we ask that you continue to give us our daily bread as your son told us to ask. But you also provide for us spiritually. Father, we know that you've made us a part of your family, the church. You've blessed our congregation with elders, with deacons. And tonight we pray for these men that they would not grow weary in doing what is right. Above all, Father, you have provided forgiveness to us through the blood of your Son. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.